Hello. It works. Tēnā um, katoa. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming this evening to the UC Connect lecture. Uh, tonight we have my dear esteemed colleague, um, Dr. Sarah Masters, who will be giving us a presentation. We'll be talking about the I haven't seen the title, talked about the other table. So before we get started, um, Sarah works in the School of Physical and Chemical Sciences. Uh, Sarah is, um, I would say, a native from Edinburgh, but I think you just spend most of your life in Edinburgh. So the weather outside, we can blame it on her. So, um, so tonight we have a really good event. It's going to be brilliant. It's one of the Connect lectures, and just a bit of. I don't get paid for this, by the way, I'm the head of school, but um, <laughs> you know, the lectures are free, but we do ask you to please register to, you know, for them in case you want to be kept informed from other lectures. Now, I can only tell you the other lectures will not be as good as the one tonight. So, no pressure. It's my great privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Sarah Masters. And, uh, no, just Sarah <laughs> Masters. <laughs> Right, should we aim at him? <laughs> there we go. Okay, so welcome everybody. So hopefully that was, this is why we didn't really want you to sit in the front row. Okay, so what you can see on the screen up here is actually uranium, okay, which is one of our elements. I'm not going to talk too much about it tonight. But for me, this video is really beautiful. If you've had a slightly stressful day, then you can put that on with the music. Um, and so uranium is radioactive. Okay? And it emits alpha particles all the time. And that's what actually you can see on the screen here. So this is a, what's called a cloudy chamber. So it's about minus 40 degrees C. And we have a sample of pitch blend in there, actually, which contains uranium. Um, for those of you that were here at the start, you probably saw somebody just popping the little sample in. Um, and that's because the alpha radiation that's coming off it is pretty harmless, actually. Just don't eat it, okay? So it won't really penetrate skin, but if you ingest it, then it's really got nowhere to go, okay? And so what you can see here is we've got some ethanol in there, which has cooled down. It's created a vapor just above the uranium. And so the uranium is emitting these alpha particles through that cloud, and then that's what you can see on the screen there. Okay. So there'll be a little bit of toing and froing, as there always is. So, Kiara Kata, Nama Haremai, and Kafa um, Ridi for that very kind introduction. So, I think before we get going too much further, and I will take the coat off in a minute, I'm not going to do the whole lecture in this, um, and there will be some loud bangs as we go through, so um, just be prepared for those. Um, so we need to define what an element is, really, before we can go too much further. And so an element is just a substance um, where the atoms all have the same number of protons, or positively charged particles, in the nucleus. And that means they all have the same atomic number, because the number of protons correlates with the atomic number of the element. Okay? So hydrogen has one proton, atomic number one, helium, two protons, atomic number two, and so on. And the elements, they're, they're the simplest substances chemically that we know. We can't break them down anymore through some sort of chemical reaction. Okay. Now, as Chemistry Cat says, we don't trust the elements because they make everything up. Um, now, quite literally, they're all around us. Okay, so when we breathe, we breathe in nitrogen, elemental nitrogen and oxygen. Um, and that's what we use to stay alive. All right. So we have um, oxygen coming in, and actually it's the nitrogen that's the greater proportion in the air around us. It's about, what, 78%, something like that. The oxygen's only about 20% that we breathe in. And, um, and then when we breathe out, we're breathing out quite a lot of nitrogen as well, so we don't really use it. We breathe out some oxygen as well, and we also breathe out some carbon dioxide, which is not elemental form, it's a, it's a molecule. So there's a chemical reaction that's happened inside our body when we're doing that. And so that's here on Earth. Um, we have this Goldilocks zone, if you like, where we've got the right atmosphere that we, we've evolved, that we can breathe in um, that oxygen and use it. 
But our Earth revolves around a very really big shiny thing in the middle of the um, solar system called the Sun, okay, which is a star, and that's principally composed of hydrogen. And that's what we've got in our nice balloon over here. Um, <laughs> And so the, the idea with the sun is that it keeps us warm, so we're far enough away from it that we don't boil, and we're close enough that we don't freeze. And that's what we mean by the Goldilocks zone. It's just the right amount of distance away. So um, as with everything, practice makes perfect. So I've not tried this out because I'm terrified of balloons. So we'll give it a countdown and we'll see if it works. It will probably be quite a loud bang if it does work. Um, if it doesn't, then we've got a backup one here, but it will take us a few minutes to get it together. So um, we'll give it a shot anyway. So let's, you need to watch it as well. Okay, everybody thinks when a hydrogen balloon goes up, it's gonna be this fantastic big bang and it's gonna go everywhere. It's pretty localized actually. So watch the balloon and we'll have a countdown from five, four, three, two, one. Uh, nothing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. So we'll check the connections and we'll try again. And if it doesn't work, then somebody else will, you'll have to go bang. Um, and, nah, not going to work. That's my batteries have gone flat. You never know. It's been a long day. Anyway, it should go bang really, really loudly. But the good news is that I don't have to wear the lab coat anymore. So that's good. Because <laughs> we're done with that. All righty, so as Chemistry Cat said, elements are all around us and they're incredibly important for what we do. And so what we have here, I'm sure many of you will have recognized the chap on the screen there, that's Tom Lehrer and he was very, very famous for his periodic table song. Now I muted this, didn't I? So I need to unmute it and then hopefully if we hit... Arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and astatine, and radium, and gold, protactinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and manganese and mercanium and lived in and magnesium, dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cesium and lead, praseodymium and platinum, plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium and tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. There's sulfur, californium, and fermium, berkelium, and also mendelevium, einsteinium, nobelium, and argon, krypton, neon, radon, xenon, zinc, and rhodium, and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to Harvard. And there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. Alrighty, so even then, um, when this animation was made up, um, we've discovered more since then. Okay, you can see it stops at RG there. That um, seventh row is now all complete. Okay, so we'll close this down. And we'll come back to this. For some reason it's not full screening, I don't quite know why. That's better. Alrighty, so the next challenge is to recite the song, okay? <laughs> Who's gonna have a go for me? Yeah, I knew there'd be a volunteer in the front row. Trouble is, Isabel, that I've got some chocolate fish as an incentive here, um, but to get the chocolate fish, you have to get at least the first four right, okay? You reckon you can do it? Maybe. Go on, you can have a crack. Go on. Hydrogen. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hydrogen's a, 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 atomic number one, absolutely, but it's not the first one in the song. So does anybody want to have a go? Any hands, any volunteers? No? Well, that means we get to eat the chocolate fish, so that's good, <laughs> okay. So just for reference, the first line is, is, and I've not got my glasses on, there's antimony, arsenic, aluminium, selenium. So there you go. So I think the whole point is that, um, you know, even with that animation coming up, there are a lot of elements out there, okay? We now have 118 that we know about. 
And unless we have some kind of order to them, then they're just all over the place and we can never remember what they are. I think we've quite ably demonstrated that, I mean, Isabel did very well. She got atomic number one, which is hydrogen. Well done. But beyond that, um, you know, we need some order and some reference to it. Okay. Now, since antiquity, there's been um, elements known about, so copper, lead, gold, silver, and so on. But in the modern day, um, the um, first uh, element that was discovered in recent time, recent times, what was it, was it 370 years ago now, was phosphorus. Right? And um, that was discovered by this chap called Heinrich Brand, who was German, and he was a merchant, a pharmacist, and an alchemist. Okay? So we've just had that um, periodic table song, and I think it became more famous in recent times when Daniel Radcliffe, a.k.a. Harry Potter, um, went on the Graham Norton show and recited it perfectly. He'd have got both chocolate fish because he could do it all. Um, and ironically enough, the search for the philosopher's stone was what the alchemists were doing back in the 1600s. So what they were trying to do was find this magic thing that would turn these useless crud, if you like, into gold. So that's really what they were looking for. And there's a very, very famous picture here called The Alchemist, which is of um, Henrik Brandt. Um, so this is uh, him, allegedly, in the basement of his building, searching for this uh, philosopher's stone. And then this is a possibly slightly more realistic representation of what he looks like. I can't really see a tremendous amount of correlation between this and this, but, you know, artistic license. You didn't exactly have cameras in those days. So what he was doing was searching for the Philosopher's Stone, but what he was actually doing was turning P into phosphorus, okay? So um, I've just got his recipe, or experimental methods, as we'd call it nowadays, up on the screen here. So you take urine, P, and you boil it into a thick syrup. So already I'm not really wanting to reproduce this experiment. <laughs> And then you heat it up until we get this red oil distilling up from it. You take that off, and then you let it cool down again. And then you get this black, spongy upper layer, and then this white, salty layer um, underneath. Now, importantly, he discarded the salt. Um, and there's a reason why I'm not an organic chemist by trade. We'll come back to that in a moment. But anyway, he discarded that lower layer, put the red oil back into the black, <coughs> excuse me, and then heated it strongly for 16 hours. Now remember, he's boiling up wee here to start with anyway. It's really not going to smell that great either. So whilst we had this idealistic picture in the background of the alchemist, I suspect it was probably not that nice. Anyway, and then we get some white fumes coming off, and then an oil, and then we get phosphorus, and then you put that into some cold water to solidify it back out again. So what was actually happening here? Okay. So when you pee, you've got phosphates in there, okay? So they contain phosphorus and oxygen. And um, you have that as a sodium salt, so sodium phosphate. And then you've got organic compounds which contain carbon. And so when you heat the thing up, the oxygen, so in the PO4 up there, the O uh, reacts with the carbon to get carbon monoxide. So we're adding that into the already really delightful mix in that basement. So as well as boiling pee, we've now got carbon monoxide, which as we all know is quite dangerous and can kill you. Um, and then that leaves our elemental phosphorus, which comes off as the gas, and then it will condense at around about 280 degrees C to a liquid and then solidify at around about 44 degrees C. It just depends how pure it is. And interestingly, it's actually approximately the same reaction that gets used today to produce phosphorus, um, only they don't use we, thank goodness, they use um, mined off phosphate ores, although, you know, mining's probably not that environmentally friendly nowadays, so they may have to go back to the original recipe, we don't know. <laughs> Interesting times, they use some coke for carbon, and they use electric furnaces rather than an open fire. Now, as scientists, we always like to ask ourselves, could he have done better? Okay, so we evaluate the literature, and then we look to see whether we can improve on the experimental um, process. And, and the answer is yes, he could have done a hell of a lot better, okay? Um, it yielded a lot less phosphorus than it should have done, um, and that's because he actually threw approximately, hard, uh, well, a great deal of his phosphorus away. Okay? So that white salty layer that he discarded actually had a lot of phosphorus in it. And had he just ground the whole lot up, he would have got a far better yield. Now, these numbers are slightly staggering, okay? He used approximately 5,500 litres 
<coughs> I say that again, 5,500 <laughs> litres of urine. <laughs> and out of that, he got approximately 120 grams of phosphorus. Now, I don't have a real idea of what time scale <laughs> he collected this over. Um, whether it was all sitting around in his basement for weeks or <laughs> whether he just went round the, the town that he lived in and everybody to pee in a bottle, I don't know. But anyway, he got 120 grams of phosphorus out of this. Um, had he actually ground everything up, he could have got a lot more. So just for reference, a litre of adult human urine contains about 1.4 grams of phosphorus salts, so about 0.11 grams of pure phosphorus on average. Um, so had he used the whole amount, he could have got about 600 grams. So there you go. Um, and the, the story there is that when I was an undergraduate, we have to separate out um, various layers in organic chemistry. I threw the wrong layer away. When I was in the labs, we spent three hours with an esteemed professor trying to work out why my reactions didn't work, at which point I decided organic chemistry wasn't for me. <coughs> but anyway, he at least got something, um, but he could have done a lot better. Okay, so this was, what was that, what did I say, 1649, something like that. Okay, so about 370 years ago. So what we have here is a timeline of elemental discovery. And what I hope, not having a very good technology day, but hopefully it will play. So we're starting around about 1720, 1730 for the sake of argument. And you can see how many elements have been discovered at that time. So we're up to about 15, 1617. And as this plays through, you'll see um, the timeline of discovery of the elements. So we're up to about, what, 26, 20, 30 odd um, at the turn of the century there. The 1800s, pretty good time. Okay, so we went up from whatever it was. And when we get to 1869, which is the magic year, we'll be sitting on around about uh, 63 or thereabouts elements. You'll notice this, uh, this gap in the middle here. Okay, this is technetium. We're going to come back and talk about this a little bit later. But everything around it has been known for a very, very long time. And you'll see that technetium doesn't get filled in until about 1930-something. Okay, so it was a <coughs> very, very difficult element to find, and we'll discover why later on. So by now, um, Mendeleev has come into play, and we have the periodic table. And you can see, oh, there we go, there's technetium. Okay, and you can see a very rapid filling in, if you like, of the gaps. Okay. And we'll just let that play, play through to the end. And then just towards the end, suddenly all these last ones fill in. There we go. And nothing since 2012. Okay, so in the 1800s, or in 1800, sorry, around about 33 elements were known. Uh, by the time we get to the mid-1800s, we were up to 63 elements. And so, as we've already demonstrated, trying to remember them all is a bit of a challenge. Okay, so can we put them into some sort of logical order? And the answer is yes, of course, we can. Um, and so, whether... Dmitry Mendeleev played Tetris or not, I'm not 100% sure, probably not. Probably wasn't invented in those times. But the idea is that there is some sort of logical order that the elements could be put into. Now, Mendeleev wasn't the first to consider that there could be some kind of ordering of the elements, and he certainly isn't the last either. But around about the same time, both Dmitry Mendeleev and uh, Julius Lothermeyer came up with this similar ordering, which has led to what we now consider to be the periodic table. And they did that in 1869. Now, uncoincidentally, this is 150 years ago, and um, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, or IUPAC, um, have declared um, that 2019 is the international year of the periodic table. Um, Delighted that we have the Secretary General um, of IUPAC in the audience, my colleague Professor Richard Hartshaw, and welcome Richard. And um, so all throughout the world this year there have been events going on to mark um, this occasion. Now, when Mendeleev was putting this together, there's a, quite a, 
a nice urban miss. He was playing cards, and then bingo, it all came to him. Um, not quite like that, no, but we do believe that there was a series of uh, note cards that he had little notes written on um, that he then managed to put into some sort of order. Okay. Now, as with everything in science, who, who got their first wins? Um, so Mendeleev published first on the 1st of March, uh, nine, uh, 18, 1969, 1869, uh, and then Maya was a little bit later in the year towards December. Okay, so um, they did um, both win a medal for this. I'll talk about that in a moment. Now, Mendeleev was predictive in what he did. He left gaps in his table, and we'll discuss that in just a moment. Okay. So they both were acknowledged for the work that they did, um, and they're trying to order these elements. Um, so on the left, we have Mendeleev. On the right, uh, we have Maya. And in 1882, they were jointly awarded the Davy Medal from the Royal Society um, for their <coughs> work on the periodic relations of the atomic weights. So remember, back in this time, Thompson and Rutherford had not come into the equation, so we didn't know about electrons, protons, and neutrons. We didn't know about it until a lot later. Rutherford predicted them, but they weren't found until a lot later. So really, all they had to go on were the atomic weights. Okay? It wasn't until the early 1900s <coughs> that electrons and, and so on were known about. And whether Mendeleev would have come up with the same system that he came up with, had he known about these things, uh, we don't know. We can, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So here is Mendeleev's table. Now, normally, in a lecture theatre where you teach science, we have a nice periodic table um, on the walls. We don't have that here, unfortunately. But when you look at this, it can be perhaps a little hard to see the patterns to start with until you start looking at it really carefully to relate it back to what we would consider to be a modern-day periodic <coughs> table. So I'm going to try using this rather than the pointer. It might just be a little easier, she says. OK, so here we have lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. OK, so that's what we would then, if we flip this 90 degrees, <coughs> we would then consider that to be the modern group one of the periodic table. Here we have uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So the J represents iodine there. So that's what we would commonly now know as the halogens. Okay. Uh, we have oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium up here, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, carbon, silicon, and then a gap, and tin, boron, aluminium, a gap, and so on. Okay. And it's these gaps here that are really, really important. Okay, so this is where Mendeleev was really predictive about what he was doing. He figured that there should be something there and that it hadn't been found yet. And so as we've gone through time, people have had a lot of fun with the periodic table. Um, I've got two kids sit at the front row who are so engrossed in what I'm saying that they're both staring at their devices. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, looking at you. Um, one of them is sitting on an iPad. Um, and if I could even remotely get her attention for a second. <laughs> Do you recognize any of these iPad apps? Yes? Good, OK, because you've got an iPad. There's a periodic table of the iPad apps. There's even a periodic table of wrestling, of which I know nothing other than number one at the top here, Hulk, I recognize. But the rest of it, not a clue. Not my sport. <laughs> But this is what we would consider to be the modern day arrangement of our elements in our periodic table. So on the left hand side, we have our um, alkali metals, and then we've got our alkali earth metals, and so on across to our noble gases on the right hand side. Okay. And all the elements that are in that periodic table can display very different bonding as well. And it's Always quite fascinating to me and baffling to the first year students that I try and teach this to that we have this very different types of bonding um, for elements. So on the left hand side, we've got metals and they have metallic bonding, they're conductive. Those electrons can move around. As we come across to the middle, we get these extended covalent structures. So carbon, for example, here is sitting in group 14 of the periodic table. It really wants to get four things around it so that it can get lots of electrons to fill its octet. It wants eight electrons around it. Okay? It's got four. It has to get four from somewhere else. 
and it does that by forming these extended covalent networks. So when you fork out a lot of money for a diamond, what you're really forking out for um, is an extended covalent network of carbon. Okay. It's very pretty, don't get me wrong. But, um, yeah, and so carbon can also take these different forms as well, different allotropes, so we can get graphene. It's been much vaunted in the literature in the last few years as being the next wonder material. And Buckminster Fullerene as well, C60, the buckyballs, the football shape as well. And then we just come across a little bit more to the right-hand side, and then all of a sudden we're into these discrete covalent molecules. Okay? And that's what we saw thrown across when we managed to avoid the head of school and not freeze them. Um, with our nitrogen, <laughs> and so nitrogen takes uh, this type of uh, form here, elemental nitrogen anyway, um, because it's got um, five electrons in its outer shell, it wants to get another three, and it can bond with itself and make a triple bond, so three shared pairs of electrons between um, the nuclei, and we get these very discrete covalent systems, and that's why it has the properties that it does. Okay, it's very, very, very low boiling point, and that's what you saw as we threw that across there, was the nitrogen boiling off um, as we took it out of, out of the flask here. So, we come back to this predictive idea that Mendeleev had, okay? And I mentioned um, both germanium and gallium, so those were the two that I had circled uh, on his original table. And so he predicted the, the presence or the existence of these two elements, and it was only a few years later um, that they were discovered because people actually went out to try and find them as a result of the work that Mendeleev did. And so nowadays, so part of the, the idea behind this lecture was, you know, what can we now do with the things that were discovered as a result of uh, Mendeleev's um, work? And so, um, I mean, I, I don't use Blu-ray discs, to be honest, because my eyesight's so bad that I really can't tell the difference in the upgrade and the, the quality of the image from a Blu-ray. But Blu-ray discs and um, LEDs, for example, all utilize the semiconductors, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide. And then when man wanted to go to Mars, and indeed women wanted to go to Mars, um, the rovers that were sent there Okay, so I think, I believe this is opportunity, so the Mars rovers that were sent there, they had to be powered somehow. Can't exactly send it up with a, you know, a tank of diesel and tell it to get on with it. And so they used solar cells, they used solar power to do that, okay? And that's um, solar cells that were pow powered through these alloys of, of gallium, germanium, and indium. So indium was already known, but both germanium and gallium were not until Mendeleev had this predictive table. Another use of um, one of the elements is uh, gadolinium, which has been discovered since um, 1869. So some of you may have had the misfortune to have had an MRI scan at some point in your life. Now, people don't like getting an MRI because you get put into a tiny little tube and it's really noisy and clunky and you feel a bit claustrophobic. But actually, in terms of being good for you, in inverted commas, it's actually much better for you than getting an x-ray. Okay, <clears throat> so MRIs use radio frequency, very, very, very low energy waves, and I'll show you the electromagnetic spectrum in a, in a moment or two, so you can understand that. But um, very, very, very low energy waves are used, and so you apply a magnetic field to the object, the body, which is lying in the MRI scanner. It lines up all the protons in your body, okay? and then you switch the magnet off, apply the field, and you're looking at the relaxation of those protons back to where they were. And depending on the environment around those protons, they'll relax more quickly or more slowly, and that then tells you about the nature <coughs> of, the, of where those protons are sitting, whether it's in bone or fat or, or muscle or ligament and so on. And so what... Um, physicians often do is inject some gadolinium just to enhance the pictures that are coming out of that. Okay. And so that's what you can see in the bottom picture there. So you've got an MRI scan before the gadolinium injection and one after. It just enhances the image. And then, of course, we've got work going on here um, at UC <coughs> around the Mars um, spectral scanner, 
which is improving the resolution of these things even more so that you can get much earlier detection um, of medical issues, but also um, so that you don't have to destroy um, precious samples. So if you have a, a meteorite, for example, you don't particularly want to grind it up and find out what's in it. So you can pop it in one of these scanners um, and it's, uh, it's much less destructive. Now, I mentioned technetium earlier as well. So if you remember, that was right in the middle of those transition metals, right in the middle of the table there. And it wasn't found until 1937. <coughs> There's a very good reason for that. Um, and that's because it doesn't actually exist on Earth. It's an what we call an artificial element. And it was actually artificially produced. Mm -hmm. um, and so you won't naturally find it on Earth, but you will find it <coughs> up in space. And um, so, for example, in um, the detection of this in the red giants and the big stars out, out there somewhere when it gets dark, um, can produce, uh, sorry, proved that these things can actually produce these much heavier elements. Mm -hmm. And so, up until you know, the turn of the century, it was really only thought that there was hydrogen and helium out there and probably not a lot else. Um, and so, by detecting this, it was found that these, these stars can actually produce these much heavier elements. So, <coughs> scientists, we all have our favorite elements, and I've picked out three in particular of my favorites, so you just have to indulge me for a moment. Um, the first of these is silicon. Okay, I've done a lot of work with silicon over the years. It's served me extremely well, actually. Um, and so I'm a, I'm a gas phase chemist by training and by trade. And so I look at what these bigger molecules, which are comprised of all the elements, actually look like. <clears throat> and at the time, this is one of the largest systems that had ever been studied with the techniques that I used. Okay. Um, and then my all-time favorite is this so-called jack-in-the-box compounds, where we have phosphorus in the very middle of the molecule. Mm. And so remember, phosphorus was the first element in modern day that was discovered from the P. And um, so this molecule can behave a bit like a jack-in-the-box. It's all compressed and squished, and it's really, really um, lots of energy in there. And you just have to heat it ever so slightly, and that energy gets released. Everything rearranges, and the molecule will break apart. And then, of course, I'm Scottish, and so we can't really go too much further without talking about strontium, uh, strontium uh, which was found or first discovered in Strontian. Uh, it's on the west coast of Scotland. <clears throat> now, ooh, it's going to work automatically, really good. Okay, so whenever we are trying to identify elements, and this hopefully will loop round, or I may just have to stand here and press it. There we go. This is quite a short video. Um, and so this is on the right-hand side. Um, we've got strontium salts, strontium chloride. In the middle, uh, we've got sodium acetate, and on the left-hand side, we've got copper acetate. And you can see that when we set fire to these things, because we're scientists and we like to do that, they burn different colors. Okay? And that's a as a result of the, of the metals that are in there. <clears throat> so strontium, we have on the, the right-hand side here, that very red flame to it. Uh, the sodium, we're all quite familiar, I think, with sodium flames, that really yellow color in the middle there, yellowy-orange. And then copper, you can see on the left-hand side there, with that very green flame associated with it. And so this is a, a little bit like a traffic light. We couldn't do it um, top to bottom as you would do with a traffic light, because it just wasn't practical. Um, and we were actually going to try and do this in here, but having spent over about half an hour setting this up and trying to get it to work, I'm quite grateful that we did a video of it. Um, <clears throat> so, now, with these, we get different colors associated with them. <clears throat> and this all comes back to the electromagnetic spectrum. And I talked about this earlier, so remember our radio frequency waves. Um, so they're very, very, very long wavelength associated with these, so very low energy. So when you're in that little tube getting your MRI, it's not actually doing too much damage to you at all. Okay? You can compare and contrast that, for example, with X-rays. Way up on the left-hand side here, you can see they have a very short wavelength associated with them, lots of energy in there, okay? The shorter the wavelength, the more energy you have associated with it. 
And that's why when you get an x-ray, it's very short, okay? So a short exposure is fine, but if you're a technician working with x-rays, you have to come out of the room just for safety. However, what we see of the electromagnetic spectrum is in the middle here, okay? There's a very short range of visible light, and we see it as a continuous spectrum. Um, that's how our eyes interpret it. But actually, with these, um, these colors, they have um, lines or energies associated with them. Okay? And that's all to do with the movement of electrons, the promotion of electrons, so they get excited up and then they relax back down to ground state and release energy in the form of light. And so we have different energies associated with that and each element is unique. And so it's like a fingerprint for the element. Okay, so we can get these lines that you can see at the bottom here have an energy associated with them. And from that, we can identify the element. And so we can use that, again, coming back to our outer space, so what's out there, to try and identify what is out there. So we can identify the element, for example. We can identify the temperature that it will be at, the density of it whether there's magnetic fields associated with it, how fast things are moving, whether something is orbiting as well. So if you've got one planet, for example, or a star orbiting another, the mass, the size, and we can discover what's out in the interstellar medium just by looking at this light that's coming to us and identifying the different elements from that. So there's an awful lot of information that we can get just from our elements. So, at the very beginning, um, well, the, the, the title of this lecture is Where Would We Be Without the Periodic Table? So, we may well be just in a, a big jumbled mess, we don't know. All right, so we could just have stuff all over the place. <coughs> now, what I'm going to contest is that the periodic table, in inverted commas, doesn't actually exist. All right. Um, so, the, the, <laughs> the periodic table or the periodic system that we have today that we would look at, the one that I showed you earlier on, doesn't really look the same as the, the system that Mendeleev came up with. Okay? We can see similarities, we can see trends, but it's very, very mutable. There's always things changing. Okay? We get new elements, we've added columns, it's changed shape, and there's still a lot of debate around its optimum configuration. So is <clears throat> this standard pattern of elements as we have it, the right way to do things. And people have their opinions, and they have quite strong opinions, and then they go and debate it. So, where would we be? Okay. Well, as I said earlier, Mendeleev was not the first to recognize patterns in elements. There were people before him, and there were very definitely people after him as well. Okay. And he wasn't the first to try and depict those patterns in a diagram either. Other people have tried to do that, and other people have done it since. Okay, so there's lots of different arrangements out there. So here's one option. Okay, so this is kind of the periodic table as we know it, but rearranged. Okay, so you can see that we've got group one and group two of the periodic table on the right hand side here. And then we've got those P block elements, so the boron, carbon, nitrogen, so on and so forth. And then we've got our transition metals, and then our lanthanides and actinides on the left-hand side. And so this is called a left step periodic table. So as you go from right to left, you're filling S, and then P, and then D, and then F, what are called orbitals, so where our electrons are found around the nucleus. Now, it's a bit of a technical term up there, so the, the meddling rule, which is all about how we fill electrons around the nucleus. And so, remember, that electrons weren't known about in Mendeleev's time. Okay, he had to go on atomic weights, and that was it. All right, so, I quite like this arrangement. I could deal with this arrangement. My brain can cope with this. It's a nice, regular pattern, and I can make sense of it when I look at it. This one, um, maybe not. All right, um, I'm sure somebody somewhere when they created this thought it made sense. I've stared at this a long time, believe me, in the process of putting this talk together, I'm still a bit lost, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I'm sure there is an order to it. What I do know is that um, as, as we come round, there's probably some order here, and then there's this sort of loop bit, sort of 
that's stuck out here that nobody quite knows what to do with, which is the lanthanides and actinides. And to be fair, that's kind of what we do with the, the current table that we know. You know, they, they get stuck down the bottom. All right, so this is just as a, as a loop out the side. Um, I don't like this one. I, can't, I don't understand it. <laughs> I look at it and it just confuses me. All right. And then um, we've got a pyramidal arrangement as well. And you really do have to stare at this, and you're very welcome to come down at the end and actually look a bit closer at the screen on this one. <clears throat> but if you start in the middle, you've got hydrogen, and then you work your way out, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, it does actually spiral all the way out in this sort of pyramidal shape. Um, and then I think that gets up to about number 86 there. Obviously, you would want to extend that round to the modern day um, number of elements that we know about. Um, so that's another option, okay? There will be plenty of other options out there. <laughs> so the point of this is that as scientists, and I think as human beings actually, we like, well, I personally like regular patterns of things, all right? And so if Mendeleev, if Meyer, if others hadn't um, arranged these um, elements in some sort of order, I think somebody would have done. Okay. Whether they would have had the foresight to be predictive about it, as Mendeleev did, I don't know. Okay, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't have a time machine, so we can't go back and find out. But what I do believe is that um, we would have some kind of regular system for arranging the elements as we know them today and that we would create some form of order out of all of the chaos of the elements that are out there. And so with that, um, thank you very much for coming along and I'm very happy to take any questions that you have. So, oh, in front of you. So, are there any questions? What's your favorite style of the periodic table? Is it the one now or the first one you showed? So, um, the one now where we've got the 118 elements, absolutely, I can understand it, but that's only because I've been looking at it for the last 25 plus years, to be honest. Um, I do like that left step one that I showed you at the end. Uh, again, it makes logical sense around how we arrange what we now know, the electrons around the nucleus. So I like those two. Are you going to have a crack at this? <laughs> if you are, just, yeah, you just, if my head explodes, then we'll know what it is. Um, I'm going to put these on just in case. Um, no. <laughs> See, it wasn't just me, but I, I do like that left step one. And if we were going to change the periodic or, you know, use a different one, then, then yeah, I, I would like that one. That curled one was hopeless to me. I couldn't understand it at all. Yep. Is, is it possible that there are still further elements to be discovered? Oh, absolutely. They're looking for them. Um, I think it's worth saying that those last few that sort of jumped in in the last um, 15, 20 years or so, Incredibly short-lived. Now, Richard may be able to comment a little bit further on this around the, the rules around when an element is not an element anymore and the lifetime that it has to have and how many atoms of it you have to make. Yep, okay. Um, <clears throat> so my understanding was they were re-looking at the criteria because um, Oganis on the, the, the element 118 incredibly short lifetime, and there's only been a couple of atoms of it ever, ever made. Um, and so does it really constitute an element? Mm, it's a bit iffy. Um, but it does rather neatly complete that, <laughs> that row of the periodic table, for sure. But yeah, they're absolutely out. They're, they're looking for them. Um, you can do a lot of things on a computer as well, and people have certainly predicted um, beyond um, what we know now, for sure. Yeah. So they're, they're certainly looking for them. I'm sure they'll find something. Yep. Do you know how to recite the song? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't, as my kids will testify, I can't sing and my memory's hopeless. Um, I've got the words down here, so you're very welcome to come and have a look. Um, sorry? 
play it again, you can all sing along. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, no, so I, don't, I certainly don't get the chocolate fish, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is, the, is there any, any implication from the periodical table to um, the the origin of of universe? I mean, the the logical order behind the 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 periodic table can you t show some ideas how universe involved or if if a human can create a, a, one element. Is it possible that there is a create, creator behind all this element, or it's just evolved naturally? Right, so uh, as a scientist, I believe in um, the Big Bang theory, so um, the, the elements were all created from um, that Big Bang and the, you know, the subsequent reactions that took place. <coughs> um, so yeah, the, the, there's some, certainly some, there's some sort of order and rationale behind them, um, but, and yeah, we can certainly you know, try try and understand what happened um, in the Big Bang, for sure. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, right. <As> if you <laughs> Are you going to stand and hold it? <laughs> no, he declined to come. Oh, actually, no, Richard's a safety officer, sorry. <laughs> right, so you're not holding it, though. <laughs> It's not going anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think the switch is. Yeah, it's, well, it should just, it should just hold it down, and then it should bang. <laughs> Perhaps I didn't hold it down long enough. <laughs> if you all just go bang really loudly. <laughs> nah, it's not working. Nah, it's too cold. Too cold for it. Sorry, was there another question? Yeah. <laughs> Would a neutron star qualify as a very heavy atom of an element? I don't know. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you need to talk to the astronomers. <laughs> We've got a fantastic astronomer joining our school in, uh, at the start of next year, Michelle Bannister. I'm sure she'd be able to answer that question. I'm sorry, I don't know. I'd have to go and look up more about that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, so so I, don't, I don't remember the name of it, but the element that you can only find out on a star... Technetium. Has it, has it been um, produced in, on Earth as well? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, But it's artificial, so you wouldn't just go out and dig it up out of the ground. It has to be man-made. How did those guys in the um, 19th century know the funny looking powder that they came up with was in fact an element? Um, because they couldn't do anything else with it. So the definition of an element is that you can't chemically reduce it to anything else. How hard did they try? <laughs> I don't know, boiled it up in some more wheat? I don't know. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I wasn't around at the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean okay, so. When you look at Henning um, Brand and his recipe, his experimental method there, that involved, it was extremely, he had to boil down 5,500 litres of whey for a start. That's not, gonna, that's not trivial. Um, he then had to heat it up for 16 hours, and that would have been trial and error as well. That's what we do today when we, we make new compounds, for example. Um, we try and use a bit of scientific rationale so that we're not boiling up large quantities of urine. But, you know, we... It's all about trial and error, um, and so he would have put a lot of time and effort into doing that, um, and he would have then tried to do other things with it and find that he couldn't break it down anymore, and that would then, you know, say that that was the definition of what an element is. Yeah. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Um, have you got a useful um, mnemonic for um, remembering the names of the elements? I was always taught, hi, oh, he likes beer by couples, not over frothy and that sort of stuff. Have you got one that goes further down the track? Um, yeah, I, um, <laughs> I was going to say when I was young, when I was an undergraduate, one of the things we had to do was learn 
the first bit of the periodic table, the bottom bit, we, we were allowed to go and look up. We had to learn the first, the first bit of it, but I, I just memorized that I never really came up. I, I had a mnemonic for the, um, the first row of the transition metals, which was, what was it, Scottish TV cameramen never feel cold or something like that. But, um, and they probably don't because they spend a lot of time out in the cold and rain because that's what it does in Scotland. Um, and so that was the, the first row of the transition metals, but that's all I had. Yeah, the rest of it, you just you stare at it every day. You kind of learn it, yeah. And the kids nowadays, they just use their iPad, so, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Um, with the new element that the Hadron Collider is trying to create, um, will you have to alter the periodic table for that? If they can definitively prove that it exists and they can satisfy Richard and his colleagues that it exists, then yes, yep, we'd get a new row because the the period it's, it's kind of complete in inverted commas as it is at the moment. We've, we've finished that row, so we'd have to move down and get an eighth row. Yep. And would we have to change the song? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the, I think there have been some efforts this year actually to update that song, um, but uh, the, the Tom Lehrer one is the original and the best, I think. Yeah. And it's got a nice catch all at the end because they haven't been discovered, so that, you know, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, so Mendeleev used atomic weights. Yes. How did he know what the weights of those atoms were? Because he wasn't able to count them. <laughs> so I've got a hundred atoms. What was yeah. he? What was their method? So they, they, were, they were commonly known at the time. But and, do you know how they figured it out? Because um, you can't stick uh, it on a scale because you don't know how many atoms you've got. Yeah. Um, well, you can take a, a set amount of it um, and weigh it. Hi. Oh, hi, thanks for the uh, lecture. Uh, with new elements being discovered then, is it likely that they're going to be less and less stable as you discover larger and larger ones, or is there some mechanism by which they might gain stability? Yeah, um, yeah so the, the, the problem with them is that they're just so huge, basically, and you've got so many electrons in there now for a neutral um, species anyway. If you've got an element 119, You've got 119 electrons for a neutral, neutral um, atom to fit in there somehow, and that's really why they're so unstable, because they just break down really, really quickly. So um, I don't know that these new elements are ever really going to have a huge amount of use for anything, but if we don't look, we won't know. Um, and so you know, we, we have to keep that discovery going. You know, if Mendeleev had created this system and then everybody said, oh, well, that's it, and stopped, then, you know, we certainly wouldn't be where we are today. And so we have to keep that scientific curiosity going, for sure. Adrian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, McDonaldium is, is on its way, is it? <laughs> it might be, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so there, there are plenty of elements that are named after people. So, um, Einsteinium, Curium, Rutherfordium, Organessum, etc. Um, again, I looked at Mr. Periodic Table for <laughs> how these things are named. But they're named through a committee, aren't they? There's a whole committee system around how these things are gained. Oh, yeah, go on. <laughs> Yep, Organesson being one of them. Yep. Cyborgium, yep. There were several names suggested, though, weren't there? So, so the whole key group there was originally thought that this was really not going to be important. 
So McDonald's Ian could be on its way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we've got we've got connections in the right places, haven't we? So. <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, they can break, though they can decay down to more stable elements. Yeah, for sure. Hi. Um, do. Okay, this this question kind of developed as I <laughs> as I thought about it further. But um, can you artificially make all of the elements? And how? Do, like, I, not asking you the process. You know, thirty seconds question. But if you if you make them, are they like are they coming from nothing, or are they coming from some something? Ah, right, okay. Um, <clears throat> you can artificially make them for sure. Yeah, why not? But um, why would you when they were already there? Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, everything has to come from something, for sure. Yeah, so you don't just create it out of nothing. So um, quite a, a, a common way of making some of these unstable things is actually to crash two other things together, um, which then generate something, or to fire something at something and break it down, make it decay to get these things. So um, yeah, yeah, you, you can do that, but... You would really only do that for um, for ones that you couldn't really just get naturally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so for, for medical purposes, for the most part, you'd, we're wanting to make a molecule out of the of the elements that you have, yes. Yeah, so you would be combining them together in a chemical reaction to create some kind of um, drug molecule, for example. And that's kind of what we do, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so um, for for medicinal purposes, for example, you would look to go and take the elements, combine them into compounds or molecules, and then react perhaps those together to make something else that would be used. Yeah. What's the most explosive of all elements? <laughs> I don't know if I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, look, um, a, lo a lot of the... The, um, the diatomic, uh, so the, the elements that have two things stuck together have a lot of energy associated with them. So um, nitrogen, for example, um, you know, that gets form of that anyway, gets used in rocket fuel. Okay, so it's pretty good propellant. Um, but there's, there's different definitions of what explosive actually means. I mean, do you mean it does a big bang or it produces a lot of energy or a lot of heat or so on and so forth? So there's lots of different definitions there. Okay. Are you saying you can make gold from other elements? <laughs> well, that's what he was trying to do when he was boiling down his weed. <laughs> In principle, why not? But um, yeah, it's it's not e it wouldn't be easy. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> Econ economically unviable, I think that would be the term. <laughs> and I'm not producing that much weed to try and do the experiments. <laughs> yep. One more. Yep. Okay, so the naming of the elements, um, so um, the ions at the end, this is sodium and lithium and so on and so forth. So the names of the elements all actually come from different origins. So some of them come from Latin, for example, um, and some of them come from German. So German was pretty much the language of chemistry until quite recently, actually. Uh, and then there are other... Um, origins as well. So there's, there's no set origin of the naming. It kind of depends when it was found um, and where it was found as well. But that, the, the ayams and, and that sort of thing, the endings will come from the, the language that it came from for the most part. Yeah. Okay. One more. <laughs> Okay, so if you were to discover an element, what would you name it? Isabellium, yeah. 
<laughs> so so um, we had this discussion on the way home once, and uh, my daughter Isabel sat in the front row here. She said to me, so <coughs> you get the proton and the neutron. So you know, if you find a new subatomic particle we were discussing there, you'll have to call it the Fendleton, because we were driving, <laughs> driving through Fendleton at the time. So yeah, I don't know what I would call it, actually. Um, Isabellium has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Imagonium? No. <laughs> Stick with Isabellium. Yep. One. Oh, hi. Sorry. <laughs> Ah, right, okay, well there were the sort of the four elements to start with, what was it, earth, wind, fire, and water, okay, and so they were the original elements in inverted commas, but they weren't really, sorry? Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> absolutely, yeah, and then, um, you know, as, as time went on, people realized that actually there, there was a lot more to it than that, and that's where the modern day elements came from. Absolutely. Cool. Sorry? Logist. Logist. <laughs> Let's not go into that. Uh, I believe so, but I. Yeah, it's a gas that comes off the fire, I think. But yeah, but you know, earth, wind, fire, and water. I think was the back back in the real, 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 real antiquity. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you do have any more questions, and if you do want to find out the words for the periodic table song, here we go. Um, just before I finish, actually, I, I meant to um, make some acknowledgements, and then we'll, we'll finish up. Um, so when you put these talks together, there's a lot of people in the background who are involved with this. It isn't just, I'm just, I'm just a talking head at the front, really. Um, and so we've got Margaret and Michaela in events um, who helped. We've got Pacquio in security who made sure that we <laughs> We're not going to evacuate the place by setting all the alarms off. Um, Grant Craig in facilities management who helps facilitate this as well. And then within the school, um, we've got Nathan Alexander, Matt Paulson, Jan, who you saw at the beginning, um, Stephen Hemmingson, and also Stephen Graham, although his balloon didn't work. So, <laughs> But anyway, um, and yeah, everybody um, within the school. And then somebody's added on here, and the wonderful head of school. It looks suspiciously like you're writing, really. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but there's a lot of people, there's a big team. Um, behind that, that brings all of this together. So I do want to acknowledge their, their work on this.